Okay, uh, morning everybody. So uh, as advertised uh, throughout this uh, mini course, uh, we went through some of the basics of the Bayesian optimization and VAEs. Uh, so today we are going to see how these uh, components can be combined together to give the deep kernel learning and uh, look at few examples of uh, deep kernel learning applied for the uh, practical problems. So first of all, uh, from the first several lectures, we learned the basic principles of the Gaussian processes, including what is kernel, what are kernel parameters, what are priors for kernel, and what are priors for noise, and why uh, they matter. We also looked at the uh, mean function in the Gaussian processes and the priors for the mean function. So again, uh, this is not a standard uh, area. This is something that emerges only in the context of the domain specific problems but not so in the context of the uh, data-driven applications so then we looked at the what is the posteriors so roughly priors is what you know before the experiment posterior is what you get after the experiment we looked at the bayesian inference and uh, we looked at some lengths at the bayesian optimization and uh, extraduced acquisition functions so sort of just as the reminder for these concepts, so the typical setting for the uh, Gaussian processes is that we have a measurement in some uh, space X and uh, we want to maximize some property. So this is a general setting for the Bayesian optimization. Uh, space X can be anything. So obviously people traditionally show it as the one dimensional R1 space, but uh, that's of course sometimes is useful most of the time, it is the parameter space of the control knobs of your microscope. It can be the space of the molecules, uh, crystal structures, processing trajectories. So basically, choose your own, uh, choose your own space. And uh, uh, somewhat unusually to physics properties, so to physics, uh, things like dimensionality of the space or differentiability of the space are actually really important. So Bayesian optimization in the non-differential spaces is a very different story than in the normal one. So anyway, uh, what we do generally as the base in the Gaussian processes is that we create a surrogate model, meaning the function and uncertainty over the full parameter space based on measurements. So we assume that we want to know the function everywhere. We've done measurement in some specific locations. We want to reconstruct the function based on these measurements as best as we can and we want to reconstruct it along with the uncertainty so gaussian process in this case is purely data driven so there is some deep physics at the stage of defining the priors for the kernel and in fact this is something that explored very very well so the kernel engineering is the big area by now but uh, you can argue that in some sense the choice of kernel reflects our knowledge of physics but practically for whatever reason the uh, gaussian process community pays attention primarily to correlations and not to the average behavior so bayesian inference is the example where we actually do know the physical model so it's some opposite sense and have some idea of parameters and we looked at the structured gaussian process where which is kind of combines the ideas from normal gaussian process and bayesian inference so when we have the physics derived uh, probabilistic mean function. So once we have the uh, surrogate model, meaning the, uh, for example, Gaussian process or structured Gaussian process, we can use it in order to make decisions. And the way that we make decisions in the Bayesian optimization is in the purely myopic way. So we always make a decision one step ahead. So as I mentioned, uh, there are ways to kind of bootstrap uh, Bayesian optimization for several steps in the future. Uh, typically, it is done very rarely because it's exceptionally computational intensive. So the classical way people use BE is to look one step ahead. And uh, the way you choose where to make the next step is by creating the acquisition function. So acquisition function generally balances uh, uh, the prediction and uncertainty. If you want to explore things, you just to, uh, you want to minimize the uncertainty. If you want to optimize, you start to focus on the value of the function. 
but uh, since it's a probabilistic model, you want to come up with a policy that balances prediction and uncertainty. So these policies are um, uh, uh, are defined in the acquisition function. So we looked at the upper confidence bound, probability of improvement, expected improvement. But it's important to know that there are always more acquisition functions out there. So we can always create uh, new ones. It is also important to know, and we will very briefly touch it in the last lecture, which would be in two weeks from now, is that once we go from the simple uh, Bayesian optimization to the examples of the uh, multi-fidelity Bayesian optimization or uh, the full learning tasks, in this case, the choice of the uh, the choice of the acquisition function becomes the primary experimental co consideration. So the uh, message here is that if you want to optimize use BOR for just one process or one setting, you can take the acquisition functions out of the box. If you want to optimize the multi-step processes or do things like theory experiment matching or whatever, so something that is real science then you really need to look under the hood of the acquisition functions and see how they work. But anyway, so with that, uh, the classical Bayesian optimization cycle is uh, as uh, given in this Fry test review. You do the measurements into location, you uh, reconstruct the function and its uncertainty, you combine function and uncertainty to create the acquisition function, you choose the maximum of the acquisition function as the location for a new measurement. Once you've done the new measurement, you repeat the process. You reconstruct the function of uncertainty, reconstruct the acquisition function, and then continue this process until you run out of the experimental budget. So by now, it should be a kind of already a, a relatively simple, and uh, I'm sure that you played with the notebooks that allow to reconstruct these individual steps. And... Uh, that's how the Bayesian optimization works in the relatively simple problems. Now, what are the problems? Uh, relatively simple cases. So what are the problems? So first of all, Bayesian optimization works in uh, only low dimensional spaces. So it is not uncommon to see papers where people use the uh, 10 steps of the Bayesian optimization uh, in the five dimensional space. And uh, sometimes uh, this type of things work uh the reason why it works is because in this case you implicitly have the mean function and your kernel length would be very large so it essentially becomes the interpolator it's not a working in the sense of discovering the data so uh, practically if you uh, want to use the bayesian optimization of gaussian processes over sufficiently complex space so even let's say two or three or four dimensional and your function have multiple uh, maxima and minima, you actually have to have fairly considerable number of points. And the purpose of the uh, first uh, notebooks was to illustrate how exactly that works. So it gives you an idea that uh, if you, you expect rapid changes in your behavior, your Gaussian process uh, kernel length should be comparable to the length scale at which property vary. So take it to the power of the dimensionality of the uh, parameter space and you have an idea of what should be your experimental budget. So all domains are different, but in the cases where I uh, that I worked with, uh, GP will give you a factor of three better than the grid search or something like Sobol uh, partitioning, but uh, maybe no more than that. So the second thing is that correlations are defined by the kernel function. So it's kind of not, uh, if the kernel function is something like RBF or matter and that's limiting, a practically kernel function can be very complicated. And as I mentioned, uh, many uh, Bayesian communities actually spend a lot of time and effort into the designing of the kernel function. It's an interesting direction to go. So depending on what type of problems you are interested in, that may be worth looking at. But uh, from my perspective, uh, kernels, uh, once you start choosing kernels, you effectively impose certain ideas about the physics of your problem. So then uh, normal B, uh, GP doesn't use the knowledge about the physics of the system. So that's the reason why we have structured GP. Uh, 
And the more important thing is that uh, we don't use the cheap information during the experiment like proxies. So this is something that can be uh, actually addressed by the deep kernel learning or by the multi-fidelity measurement. So we'll talk about it uh, partially throughout the next three lectures. So the question becomes, uh, if uh, Gaussian processes work very well in the low dimensional spaces, but don't really work uh, very well in the high dimensional spaces, can we find a way to make a high dimensional space into the low dimensional space? And by this point, if you remember the lecture about the variational autoencoders, you probably kind of start to make a connection. Maybe this is something that we can actually use. But uh, before we go there, let's uh, look at some examples of the practical problems where it is necessary. So one uh, very obvious example, which is, uh, emerges in the context of microscopy, is building structure property relationship. So in many microscopies, you can measure structure as your uh, STM image or dark field image or topographic image. You can measure property by ELS or by IV curve or by the CITS curve. So very often you want to build the relationship between the structure and property ideally without uh, taking the measurements on the grid. So this is where my uh, and my group rode into the deep kernel learning started. There are other examples. For example, we can be interested in things like molecular discovery and quantitative uh, uh, activity structure relationship. This is also building the relationship and exploring high dimensional spaces. So in this case, our high dimensional space is the molecular space, which is obviously very high dimensional. And uh, we are uh, trying to explore the function which represents the uh, certain functionality, either whatever drug behavior or catalysts or uh, behavior or whatever. And the third example is uh, can be process optimization. So we are going to talk about the structure property relationship and microscopy uh, in a week from now. Today, let's just look at the processing optimization, which is a relatively simple problem. So what are the examples here? So obvious example is uh, making steel. So obviously making steel was a very, probably the primary task for humanity for uh, about a thousand years. So throughout the iron age and steel age. And uh, making steel is complicated, took a lot of time to optimize. So for example, the typical heat profile for sufficiently complex steel looks like this. And in principle, uh, we can understand why it uh, has to be this way based on the analysis of the phase diagram for the iron uh, carbon system. Uh, of course, uh, we also need to understand the role of the other dopants like chromium, nickel, or whatever. But let's put it this way. It took a lot of time for people, uh, humanity, to learn how to make steels. And uh, even now, uh, we have the idioms associated with the Damascus steel. So being good in met uh, metallurgy gives you a huge advantage at that time and probably now as well. So there are other examples. So for example, charging the battery. So we all have uh, batteries in the cell phones and the laptops, whatever, I mean, electric vehicles. So the, there is an obvious economic impact because on the one hand, we want to charge the battery as fast as possible. At the same time, we don't want to charge it in such a way that we induce the thermal runaway. So if you ever seen the movies of the electric car uh, burning or even the small laptop battery uh, burning, that's actually pretty impressive. So it's great that it's not happening that often. There are other things like manufacturing. So very often if you manufacture a aforementioned battery or currently the big uh, challenge is the manufacturing of stable hybrid perovskite in films. So if you learn how to make them by the roll to roll production and make them stable, then it would be a, a disruptive change in the green energy because you would be able to put solar energies, solar batteries basically on every car and every house. And that's kind of enough to cover the US energy needs. But the problem is that it's a very complex uh, manufacturing problem because these materials have very complex phase diagrams and multiple internal equilibria. And there are even maybe not as uh, exciting, but uh, interesting examples like pulling ferroelectric materials. 
So uh, in some cases, like when you make a steel, uh, you that's a system which is very well in, uh, explored in terms of the mechanism. However, the question becomes, can we optimize the trajectories if we have limited or no mechanistic information when our budgets are limited, but we have some access to the domain exp uh, expertise? So, for example, can we make the charging of the battery better? Because currently, battery is essentially uh, charged in two segments. One is when you keep uh, current constant and uh, trace the voltage. Once the voltage approaches some threshold, you basically fix the voltage and uh, monitor the current. So we, surely we can do better than that. Not sure how much better, but this is relatively simple uh, optimization trajectory. So let's look at the example. So, uh, and this example actually uh, relates to the charge to the ferroelectric material, even though we've done similar work for the, uh, for the uh, battery charging. So in this case, uh, the uh, model that we uh, played with is the sort of hybrid of the lattice model and the Ginzburg-Landau model. So you have the spins on the lattice. The free energy for each spin is the classical uh, Ginzburg-Landau free energy. And then there is a, some depolarization field, which we assume is given by a single factor. So we solve the local problem in the mean field approximation. We don't deal with the uh, full uh, calculation of the depolarization fields. So practically for the purpose of this lecture, the only thing that you need to know about this model is that uh, it is a model of the ferroelectric material and can emulate the salient aspects of the physics of this of these materials. So the salient aspect in question is that if we apply the field that goes like a sinusoid across the uh, across time, the, and the measure the polarization of the material, sort of just integrate the total spins, we will have a hysteresis loop. And uh, of course, we can calculate these hysteresis loops as the function of the materials parameter. So in our case, this parameter is alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and so on. And we can uh, calculate these hysteresis loops as the function of the uh, electric field or as a function of the uh as a function of time or the function of temperature so the nice thing about the model uh is that we also have access to the microscopic degrees of freedom so we can visualize the distributions of the spins inside the system and uh, the reason why we introduced this model at that time was because uh, we had some ideas about how to compare it to the uh, observations by electron microscopy and uh, how to generally model the behavior of ferroelectric materials. So kind of following the Einstein principle that uh, your model should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. If we want to model images, we of course need to have a model that has access to the microscopic degrees of freedom. And uh, we already knew that Ising model is too simple. So uh, again, for the time being, let's assume that all we care about that this is a model that uh, has some control parameters and uh, is also sensitive to the processing history. And the fact that it is sensitive to the processing history simply follows from the fact that you have a hysteresis loop. So if the system has no hysteresis, then uh, if it has the either global or local return point memory, meaning that the microstates don't depend on the history, but depend only on the parameters, so no hysteresis, no nothing. In this case, obviously, we don't, we cannot study the dependence of the field history because it's irrelevant. In this particular case, this is the model where the field history is actually relevant. For example, if I am at uh, electric field 100, it matters whether I came from this field from the low field direction or whether I came to this field from the high field direction. So values of the polarization would be different and the uh, microscopic states would be different. So there is no return point memory in this case. Now, how can we explore the behavior of this model? So the simplest way is to define some parameter spaces which are sufficiently low dimensional. So for example, I can say, look, I don't care about the most of the values of the parameter in the Hamiltonian. I'm just going to focus on two or three 
Or I can say that, look, I'm not interested in the whole field histories. I'm interested only in the sinusoidal ones. And for the sinusoidal ones, I care only about the uh, magnitude, how much uh, field I apply and maxima. And I care about the period of the oscillations. So if our parameter space is relatively small, we can, of course, calculate things on the grid. So this is, for example, loop area is a function of some parameters. This is a loop asymmetry as a function of some parameters. Uh, but grid calculations take quite some time, even for simple models. So the first uh, thing uh, that we explored uh, here a few years ago is, uh, can you use the Bayesian optimization for that? Now, let's look at how it is done. And uh, uh, you are going to see the steps over and over again in the subsequent uh, several lectures. So it's important to follow the logic. So we start with the model, this uh, with certain uh, parameter space. So again, I show you the example of this model for ferroelectric, but the model can be anything. It can be DFT calculation of the specific property of the molecule. It can be actually experiment, for example, measuring of the battery. So it really doesn't matter what it is. So once uh, we have the model or experiment, we define the target function. So what is the behavior that we're interested in? So it can be a, a complex objects. For example, for ferroelectric material, we may be interested in the history of this loop. It can be a, a, for battery, it would be charge discharge curve. For uh, steel, for example, it can be a mechanical testing curve. So once we have this target functional, we need to define one or small number of the target functions. So uh, something that can be our uh, scalar optimization target. If we have one target function, so a scalar, then it becomes Bayesian optimization. If it is several of them, then it is a multi-objective Bayesian optimization. And uh, then what we want to do is we want to explore the parameter space, trying to uh, improve this particular target function. So it turns out that, okay, you already seen this uh, slide. So it turns out that simple Bayesian optimization works. And these are the example of how we explore the parameter space uh, of this model. So for example, let's assume that I want to explore the parameter space where my target is for the uh, hysteresis loop area to adopt some critical value. So as you can see from uh, this ground truth behavior, uh, the lines of the constant uh, hysteresis loop area, they are kind of uh, roughly lay like hyperbolas. So the target for my Bayesian optimization is to find these regions. And as you can see, after a while, it actually converges and finds the regions where this behavior is a hyperbola. So Bayesian optimization works, no problem. Uh, the problem, however, is that uh, the system does not have a, a return point memory in this particular case, which means that I am really interested in looking at trajectories. And uh, for polarization, things are relatively okay, but let's assume that I'm interested in some other property of the polarization distribution, for example, curl. So the interesting thing about curl is that uh, in some sense, this would be the symmetry breaking in this system because you have a system that doesn't have any terms that are responsible for curl. You apply the uniform electric field. So the only way the curl can appear if there is some symmetry breaking mechanism that allows it to appear. And this symmetry breaking mechanism can be associated with the disorder. So what you see here is the disorder uh, applied electric fields, the evolution of the polarization, the red curve, the evolution of the curl the green curve. And you can see that lo and behold, for whatever reason, we actually start to have some curl values in the system. But we don't know exactly how they depend on the field history. So for those of you who are uh, familiar with the history, you might have heard that during the World War II, the big thing was the demagnetization of the ships because uh, at that time there was a very active uh, naval mine warfare. So there were the classical picture of the naval mine, which has the impact detonators. That's kind of World War I period. During World War II, the dangerous mine were the ones that were detecting the magnetic signature of the ship and uh, were kind of uh, sensitive to the total magnetization. So one of the questions at that time was, 
how can you demagnetize the ship? So how do you apply the magnetic field in such a way that after it, the magnetization of the ship will become, or submarine or whatever, will become zero? So in some sense, uh, we have a very similar problem, except that we want to try to find a field history that will make the curl large rather than, rather than polarization zero. So let's see if uh, our variational autoencoder can help. So we know that the fundamental property of the variational autoencoders is to take a large dimensional object and uh, compress it to the Latin space. And uh, the whole idea is that we should be able to decode from the Latin space to uh, get something very close to the, our original high dimensional object. So we cannot use the Bayesian optimization in the uh, full space of trajectories. So maybe we can use it in the Latin space of the autoencoder. Now, here comes a very interesting statement that uh, you can argue that, strictly speaking, there is an infinite number of the uh, possible uh, trajectories of the process. And therefore, and I mean, you can take a realization of the random noise that's a legitimate, uh, a legitimate trajectory. And therefore, we cannot expect that the question becomes how are we going to select the initial uh, family of the trajectories that we are going to compress. This is an absolutely correct question. So there are no solid answers here. So the way that uh, the way forward that we explored was to create a set of trajectories that reflect what we know from the domain perspective. For example, for problems involving ferroelectric and ferromagnetic materials, it makes sense to consider the trajectories that have sinusoidal component and uh, they either have the kind of decaying oscillations or they have increasing oscillations uh, that include offset, kind of high and low. And uh, the ones that uh, have different, uh, uh, different rate of the decay. So as you can see, some of them decay very fast, some of them decay very low. It also makes sense to vary the phase because phase basically gives us the final point here. So this uh, set of the trajectories is formulated to be, be sufficiently broad based on our domain expertise, but not too broad. There are multiple other ways to do that. So that's the case where, uh, as I said, domain expertise, modeling, and uh, machine learning come together. So there are no general recipes for doing it, uh, but you can create a sufficiently large family based on what you know about the systems. So let's assume that we uh, create this, uh, uh, we create this uh, set of trajectories and then we compress them in the Latin space and then we decode the Latin space. And as usual, we see the, uh, so this is probably the first time I show the uh, Latin space for the one dimensional data sets, but you can see that we deal with the classical uh, disentanglement of the representations. Again, here it is done for the 2D case. It's possible to do it for high dimensions. It's just not that convenient to visualize it. Now, one thing that we can do, which is always a good thing when we to try when we work with the uh, synthetic data, is where we know the ground truth labels, is to basically look at the distribution of the ground truth labels in the um, Latin space. So here, our labels are amplitude, uh, decrement, frequency, and offset. So here you can see the distribution of uh, alpha, which is our uh, decrement of our oscillations. You can see that it actually has some uh, well-defined behavior. So it's large on the periphery of the Latin space. It kind of becomes smaller close to the center. So our second Latin variable is uh, omega, so which is the frequency. As you can see, it actually uh, completely disentangled from the decrement, so you can see that it also forms the periodic ordering, but the line of this ordering locally are orthogonal to alpha. So we've already seen this behavior, so by now it is recognizable. That's what makes uh, out encoder super powerful, uh, and uh, so there is some internal order in the latent manifold, and uh, other factors of variation don't affect it as much. Now, what we are going to do in this case is uh, we are going to calculate the ground truth behavior 
So for the time being, we have not done any active, active experiment. We just calculate the ground truth behavior. So in order to do that, we take all our trajectories, we put them in the latent space of the out encoder, we decode them, we take the decoded trajectories and set it to our numerical model, and then we plot the output of the numerical model in the latent space of the out encoder. So here, the uh, axes are latent variables, and the color in this case is the uh, curl obtained as the result of the trained out encoder. So the good thing here is the out encoder is the generative model, meaning that we can decode trajectory and calculate the polarization curl uh, for each point in the latent space. Comparatively, our initial uh, set of the trajectories give us some latent distribution where we have a trajectory corresponding to each point here, but here we have no point, so there is no in input trajectory corresponding to this point in the latent space. So we use the generative point property of the out encoder in order to sort of extrapolate between the examples we have given to the system. And our natural hope is that if we take all these trajectories and train our model on them, you can see that, uh, first of all, we will have a lot of uh, calculations in some regions of the parameter space and very few calculations in others. And we hope that the out encoder will be able to generate the examples that will behave better or give us better functionality than any of the original trajectories. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with the use of machine learning for molecular discovery or materials optimization, uh, the, they use exactly the same approach. So it is, uh, it is uh, VIE encoding the molecular structures and then running BO on, this, on the resulting space. But in this case, uh, we get an opportunity to look on the ground truth behavior, which you kind of never have an option in the molecular discovery problem. And uh, when you look at the ground truth behavior, you can see that the parameter that we're interested in have actually pretty bad distribution in the latent space. So what do I mean by bad? So we are interested in the region when the function value are high, so the bright regions. You can see that these regions, first of all, they have a relatively low dimensionality, so they clearly form uh, relatively narrow regions. Secondly, these regions are well separated. And thirdly, for example, you can see an interesting properties here, but this ridge with the potentially interesting properties is separated from this ridge by the, uh, by the throw here. So imagine that you want to explore this. Imagine that you don't have access to the ground truth. You want to uh, optimize using the, uh, something like uh, uh, gradient descent. Uh, I'll talk about it later. So, so we talk about the uh, when uh, we use something like gradient descent. Imagine that I choose by chance my starting point for the gradient descent here. So the gradients around this point are effectively zero. Same thing here. I mean, in this case, they're not only zero, they're negative, so I won't, don't want to be here. And if I try to go up, I can go up the gradient either to this location, which is OK, or to this location, which is not. And then here I am stuck. So a second problem that uh, if I start, let's say, somewhere here, then gradient descent is not going to land me here or here. So that's already a very good example of why we need something more complicated. But it turns out that this uh, scenario is actually very complicated for the uh, Bayesian optimization as well. And the reason for that is that uh, the width of this manifold is fairly narrow, which basically means that uh, your uh, training should be sufficiently long so that the kernel length scale manages to, be, to, find, uh, to become small enough to localize these regions. And the only way the kernel length scale can be small is if your sampling points everywhere are fairly dense for the very simple reason that you, we know because we have access to the ground truths that the maxima are here. If you start to explore it like a Bayesian optimization does point by point, it doesn't know that there is no objects like this here or here. Once it learned the correlation lengths, 
it would be looking for the objects of the size everywhere. So that being said, uh, so this is a kind of few more examples of this uh, behavior. So we can get the same curves for the polarization. We can get it for the normalized curve. So there are other parameters we can look at. And you can see that for polarization, it would be a little bit easier because polarization have a well-defined maxima. You can actually get here, at least to some of them, using the gradient descent. But curl, curl is a problem, or normalized curl is a problem. So the maxima are very, very weird. So uh, we can obviously try to do the due diligence in the sense of the physics by looking at the trajectories, curl uh, behavior during the different trajectories and so on. It's useful to get insight in the model. It's not so useful in terms of optimization. It's a, again, it's a due diligence that needs to be done. Can we run the Bayesian optimization? Yes, we can. So in this case, we have 100 initialization points. We run the B for 500 points. We use the fairly curious uh, function. And as you can see in the end, we kind of found the behaviors that we're interested in. It's not bad because we explored only 600 points out of the 10,000 that we used for the ground truth. So it's not bad and we managed to find uh, at least this maxima. We did not find this ridge because none of our points actually hit close to that. But it's good. It's better than uh, grid search. It's better than the gradient, but it's nothing to write home about. So can we do it better? So in order to do it better, let's just uh, put everything together and just have one more time uh, grand view of what we have done. So we took the training set that we uh, generate somehow from the domain expertise. We put it in the out encoder, which uh, get us the Latin space. We uh, decode from the Latin space now with the uniform sampling of us with some sampling of the Latin space. We take the decoded trajectory. So we use the fact that out encoder is the generative model, send it to our theoretical model. So it can be model, it can be experiment, uh, whatever. We calculate the output and we use the output as the optimal function that we want to optimize over the Latin space. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that the success of the Bayesian optimization in the Latin space clearly depends on the shape of the manifold that the points of interest form. So that part is clear. That's what we kind of seen in this process. But the important thing is that for the VAE, and that's a really, really key statement, that for the VAE, the shape of the manifold is determined by the properties of the data only. It does not depend on the properties of our target function. So it determines by the uh, strengths of the correlation in the data. So, and uh, our uh, useful regions are have the shape which is determined by two things. How strong is the correlation in data reflected in correlations and properties? So this is item number one. And the second thing that matters is the weight of the good trajectories. So for example, if I uh, somehow end up having five times more bad trajectories that don't give me the functionality that I'm interested in, then my good regions would be squeezed to the smaller part of the Latin space and correspondingly finding them will become much more complicated. That's a, a type of uh, problem, by the way, that, uh, my, that molecular discovery community now has, because uh, when you look for molecules with the useful functionalities, uh, so if you want to find something like a homoluma gap or ionization energy or PKA or other parameters, all molecules have them. So, and these are relatively strongly correlated with the properties. If we try to find the more complex functionalities, for example, some specific biological activity or for inorganic materials, if we look for the high temperature superconductors, uh, that becomes much more complicated because there are classes of materials where correlations reflected in properties, but for vast majority of materials, there is no high uh, temperature superconductivity behavior. So the weight of the bad trajectories is very large. So the machine learning strategies for exploring the Latin space are not very, uh, not very successful. 
So the question is, uh, can we uh, do we have an alternative? And uh, since the Ferrosim uh, example is fairly complicated, let's just go back to our cards data set because it's relatively simple and I've used it for the VAEs and try to define the active discovery problem over the cars data set. So in this case, uh, you already seen the example during the last lecture that how we create our cards, how we create the uh, how we create the disordered set. So we add rotations at shear and sort of make them it's kind of machine learning version of uh, mixing the deck. And you've seen the examples of how the Latin spaces of the out encoders look like. So if we take this set of cards, send it to the out encoder, uh, this is what we get. This is our manifolds. This is how the uh, ground truth labels look like. This is how the shear is distributed. This is how the rotation is distributed. So again, we have the local uh, clustering and disentanglement of the continuous factors of variation. But uh, globally, it is a mess. And if we don't have access to the ground truth uh, labels, we will not be able to actually separate this mess in any reasonable way. Uh, of course, uh, kind of, uh, if we find a way to uh, decouple the factors of variation that we know, for example, if we use the rotation invariant VA, then our Latin distributions become much better. So anyway, this is a reminder. Uh, and the question becomes, can we come up with a strategy that allows us to construct the Latin spaces and, cons uh, and uh, correspondingly use the discovery or optimization problem uh, in a better way? So again, VIE creates Latin spaces based only on the correlations and the factors of vari correlations or equivalently factors of variability in the data set. It really doesn't care about our target functions. So sometimes uh, we can get some insight looking at the, uh, looking at the uh, ground truth labels, but ground truth labels basically already means that we know the answer. And here comes the deep kernel learning. So deep kernel learning can be used in uh, multiple uh, scenarios. So today I will show the example for cards and process optimization. Uh, in a week, I will show how it actually works in the real world uh, structure property discovery in microscopy. But let's look at first at the basis for the DKL. So what is it? And on the layman uh, level, DKL is a very simple thing. It is basically the hybrid of the half of the out encoder so you start with your input, which is, has the dimensionality of your data. You have a set of the convolutional filters, or it can be fully connected layers, can be convolutional, can be a graph network, doesn't matter. So this part of the network takes your input data and uh, uh, compresses it down to the low dimensional uh, latent representation. And then on top of this latent space, we have the Gaussian process that builds the relationship between the latent vector and your target function. So uh, the way this uh, network is defined in general is that this can have any dimensionality. So this can be a spectrum, this can be an image, this can be a molecular structure encoded as the adjacency uh, graphic or smiles or selfies or whatever. Uh, this, of course, is a latent variable, lat latent vector. Target can be a scalar or target can be a vector. So it depends on whether you have uh, what type of uh, output of the Gaussian process you, you use. So uh, in principle, the GPAX realizes the uh, vector decoding. Practically, uh, for all the workflows that we uh, have explored to date, uh, scalar output is sufficient. Now, you can ask what is the difference between the deep kernel learning and the combination of the VAE and Bayesian optimization. And the difference is that uh, once you have a VAE, your embeddings are static. So you generate them based on the full data set and then you don't change them anymore. So VAE, of course, can be retrained when you in inject new data and so on and so forth. But uh, the way that used now is by having the static embedding. Uh, 
and uh, you may also have noticed that very often when people work with uh, uh, large language models and so on, embedding is a big part of the secret sauce that makes them successful. So in case of the, and uh, whatever happens in the Latin space really does not depend on what our target function is. So when you work with the deep kernel learning in the active regime, then the embeddings are dynamic. So you start with all the inputs and partially known targets. So you start with all the inputs because you have access to the full parameter space, right? So if you deal with the low dimensional function, you can just sample on the grid. If you deal with some molecular discovery properties, then you have access to the full molecular space that you want to explore. If you have a, a, a structure property relationship problem in non-indentation or a scanning probe microscopy, electron microscopy, you have access to the all image patches. And then your target becomes available one by one. So, or it batches if you want, but kind of generally sequentially. And the thing is that your embeddings, your whole network is retrained once you have a new target value, which basically means that your embedding dynamically changes. So this is the biggest difference between the DKL and the Bayesian optimization over the Latin space of the VAE. And uh, this uh, makes this algorithm considerably more effective. So let's see how it works. So uh, let's start with the CARVS data set. So obviously the CARVS were not uh, designed to be used in this way, but let's uh, start with the discovery problem where we consider the label to be the function. So we have multiple uh, cards. They have different orientations. They have different shares. Let's assume that we want to discover the label. So we say that if our label is, say, clubs, then we make it one. If uh, it is not clubs, then it is zero. So how, uh, how would the Latin spaces look like? So this is the example. So this is the ground truth labels. This is uh, the DKL that is run on the full data set. So in this case, uh, we just give the system all the answers from the very beginning. So what can you see here? You see that the manifolds are remarkably simple. They're just straight lines. And you see that uh, the clubs become a separate manifold and uh, all other labels are bungled together. So why is it cool? It is cool because if we try to do it with the VAE, then we get the distribution of the labels like that. So the difference is already immediately visible. So here, all the labels are mixed because the VAE tried to create the Latin space uh, based on the images of the data only. Our VAE does slightly better but uh, still you see that the uh, manifolds corresponding to the different data sets are kind of crossing each other, cannot be fully separated. When we do the DKL, we try to create the manifold based both on how the data look like and on the value of the label. And in this case, we give a preference to the clubs. First of all, manifolds become much simpler. Secondly, you can clearly see that our uh, clubs are separated individually. We Interestingly, we still have this property of the disentanglement of the representation. So for example, our rotations now become uh, uh, changing across this manifold rather nicely. So shares not really tries to kind of disentangle in the uh, opposite kind of orthogonal direction. So what does it tell you? It basically tells you that now we have a method that is uh, sort of supervised kind of does it hold for other labels? Let's say I want to run the same algorithm for parts. See what happens in this case. Parts are separated in one group. All other labels are stuck together. Again, this is very, very interesting because we told our algorithm that it should care about the parts and uh, that's ones, everything else in zero. And our algorithm somehow trained the out and order part of it in such a way that it can clearly separate hearts, but cannot separate anything else. So it learned to do the task that we asked it to do at the cost of doing all other things more poorly. So 
that's actually great because of, in experimental scenarios, there are things that we care about and things that we don't care about. VIEs care about everything equally. Again, we can check how the rotations and uh, shear behave. So clearly, they are not disentangled very well. Okay, so what uh, uh, what happens if we play with the spades? So again, it works nicely. Notice that now, uh, if we do the spades, uh, it puts it in the center of the Latin space, and uh, other suits are kind of outside. Again, we kind of see a little bit of the disentanglement of the uh, rotation, but not so much for sure. Okay, interesting. Now, let's assume that I want to change the rule of the game. Rather than finding one suit compared to everything else, I want to, uh, to separate all four suits. And what I do here is something that, uh, as you know, uh, you should never do when you do machine learning. I basically assign the numerical values to the uh, categorical variables. I say that, let's say, diamonds are zero, uh, uh, the, uh, the clubs are one, and so on. But again, this is a model case, so I can do that. And lo and behold, this is my ground truth labels. This is my predicted labels. And uh, this is the rotations. They want to be disentangled. This is shear. They also want to, but there is not enough real estate in the two-dimensional Latin space to disentangle them very well. Interesting. So let's try to make the problem a little bit more complicated. So now, rather than uh, trying to uh, separate the suit of the card, I want to find the shear or rotation. So this problem becomes very interesting because I say, look, this is my collection of the randomly shear or rotated cards. What I want to do is I want to build a function that take the card, finds out the shear, it doesn't care about rotation or the suit. It turns out that this is possible. So this is uh, what happens if I train the DKL in this way. So this is a, a ground truth labels. They are all mixed together. So basically, we build a network that cannot differentiate the different suits of card, but uh, which is supposed to be the largest factor of uh, variability here. But nonetheless, that's not what we care about. At the same time, shear distribution over the Latin space becomes perfect. Remember that in all our previous examples, shear gets the last one to get uh, disentangled. So uh, the in terms of the factors of variability, the difference between the suit um, uh, values most, uh, rotation typically goes second, shear only if there is uh, enough space, uh, enough dimensionalities. So in this case, it actually disentangled very nicely. Rotations actually got disentangled as well, even though kind of not particularly well, but the, sh but the suits of the card are not differentiated. Okay, that's interesting. So let's the same th do the same thing for rotation. So now we care about rotation. This is our target function. We don't care about the suit of the card. We don't care about the shear. Lo and behold, it worked. So this is our predicted target. This is our rotations, uh, ground truth labels. So they're almost the same. Everything else jumbled together. Shear kind of tries to get disentangled, but not very successful. Okay, then you can say that, look, this is great. You show us uh, how the things work. But in this case, that's not an active learning. This is the algorithm which is trained on the full data set. If we have a full data set, uh, so what do you learn? And uh, in some sense, you can say that uh, this is roughly the same difference between the PCA and the linear discriminant analysis. So the PCA is the linear unsupervised method. Uh, LDA is the linear supervised method. So you show us the equivalent of the nonlinear LDA, whereas the VAE is the nonlinear version of the PCA. That's true. But as I mentioned, the nice thing about DKL that it can be implemented as the active learning because we can give it access to all the features, some of the targets, and then we can ask the algorithm to tell us what is the next feature is for which it want to learn the target. So it becomes self-navigating. And uh, this is exactly what uh, we can do. So in this case, we start with relatively large number of points, 100 initialization and 500 
uh, bio exploration. So we use our usual upper confidence bound acquisition function. But look what happens in this case. So now we train the algorithm uh, in active manner. And uh, uh, this is our measured point. This is what is sampled during the algorithm. This is our unmeasured points. So this is prediction for remaining several thousand cards. This is our, this is all the points together. And these are the ground truth labels. There are some interesting things that you will notice here. So first of all, I'm not sure if it is obvious or not, but you will see that once the algorithm work, it actually sampled much more than the equal fraction of the large, of the, la of the right hand. So once we made this algorithm to be the active learning with some optimization function, meaning find us the label, which is one, it will spend much more time looking for labels that they are one than everything else. That's good. Uh, because after all, we are talking about our experimental budgets and our experimental budgets are limited. So since uh, experiment is expensive. Second interesting thing is that you will see that this, uh, I mean, this is kind of subjective uh, claim, but at least for this example, you will see that the manifold is actually much more structured than for the case when we try to train uh, on the full data set. So you see here that these manifolds are kind of still potentially close to each other and overlapping. So the gap between the right answer and the incorrect ones is actually fairly small. So once we do it to the active learning, the gap between the correct examples and the incorrect examples is actually much larger. So let's see if it holds. So this is uh, another example where we again run DKLBO, but now use the hearts. And again, we do it as the active learning. So see what happens. So in this case, our manifolds are exceptionally well uh, positioned. The discovery is not perfect. So in this case, uh, the algorithm learns how to interpolate. So there are examples of the cards which it is not sure about that, uh, whether these are hearts or everything else. However, the important thing is that this is an active learning process, which basically means that uh, we run things in the active manner so our original set of the examples doesn't have this dichotomy. So these are true answers. Then there is a little bit of interpolation between them. So for some of the examples, the algorithm is not certain whether they should be hearts or not. And as you can see on the ground truth labels, some of these uncertain points are uh, hearts, the true labels. Some of them are label number three, whatever it is. So I forgot. So in principle, we can uh, put a usual logistical curve on top of it and get our usual uh, uh, area under the curve, the confusion matrix, all these uh, characteristics. So it's just a little bit of the analysis of the data. But the important thing stands, so it's an active learning. What about a continuous fact, uh, function? So let's try to do the same thing for shear. So in this case, what we are doing is that we have the full collection of cards. We pick 100 and say that we know the shear for this, uh, for this uh, specific 100 cards. And then the algorithm tries to predict shear for all remaining cards, irrespectively of their suit or rotation. And uh, it tells us that I can predict it well for these cards, but for this I have a high uncertainty. Please uh, give me the labels for these ones. So that uh, we run it uh, dynamically for 600 times. And by the way, uh, another uh, way we can use this approach is actually for uh, labeling the data because uh, classically we label the data and then we train the, uh, we train the supervised network, uh, which is very inefficient. So because we have to train a lot of uh, data and we don't know which one is uh, uh, over, represented as an example and which one is underrepresented. So the DKL actually can be used for suggesting how to train the data more efficiently. But anyway, so once we do that, we uh, create our, this is our exploration. So our measured points, this is unmeasured points, then this is put together. And again, you start to see something interesting. 
So compared to the uh, case when we train the manifold using the full data set. So this uh, looks uh, kind of cleaner, but you start to notice that uh, this manifold is also exceptionally well behaved. So the interesting functionalities are basically sitting over this part of the Latin space. Everything else gets uh, jumbled together. We can do the same thing for rotation, just to be kind of certain. Uh, interesting thing is that your regions where the rotation is high or low become much better behaved. So they have almost tried to be compact. In this case, however, there is a difference between the latent uh, between the ground truth labels. So you see that this is our decal prediction. This is the ground truth. So we captured the intrinsic distribution well, but uh, the ground truth is much more kind of scattered. So this is a little bit optimistic. Again, uh, the decal on the full data set in this case will work better, but if we already have a full data set, we don't need to do the uh, decal. It's not an active learning problem. And now let's see how it works for our uh, Ferrosim problem. So is it uh, going to make things easier or not? So the way that we use the decal for process optimization, in this case, we start with the full trajectory space. So we have access to all uh, trajectories that can be out there. We send them all together to the decal. We pick one prediction and uh, send it to the theoretical model and uh, get the answer. And then we retrain the model and uh, explore the next point in the latent in the uh, trajectory space. So see what happens in this case. So this is the example of the case when we do the static training. So again, on the full uh, data set, you can see that the distribution of the curls is relatively much better behaved. So if you remember, we had this uh, very weird shapes in the Latin space of VAE. Comparatively, if we look at the Latin distribution uh, for the decal, you can see that the number of maxima is much smaller and they're kind of well behaved. Same thing, uh, then we can look at the counterfactuals. For example, if this is our distribution, we can look at how is the polarization distributed. You can see that uh, polarization tends to be a maxima where the curls are small, but that's something that we actually knew before and uh, something that remains connected to the physical mechanism. The normalized curl seems to be very different. So we can try to do the same thing for the normalized curl. Again, there are some well regions, compact regions where the value is high. Uh, uh, the Sorry, for the normalized curve here, the total curls are relatively more uh, diffuse over the Latin space. So basically it means that for this particular example, these functionalities are correlated. So you remember that for cards, if you don't care, if you care about the, uh, if you care about the suit, then uh, everything else doesn't get disentangled. If you care about the shear rotation, then suits and the other factor of variability don't get disentangled much. So if two things uh, disentangle together, that means that they are correlated, which kind of in this case tells us something about the physics. We can also run the decal on the polarization. So in this case, you can see that uh, polarization forms the manifold like this, uh, normalized curves is like this, and then the total curls are there is some ordering, but uh, it's kind of more scattered. Again, what happens if we do the active learning? So now we run it as the true active experiment. We start with all the trajectories uh, and uh, use the DKL in order to su suggest where to look for the next location. And it turns out that it actually works remarkably well. So this is our measured points. It forms two clusters. This is our unmeasured points. This is the total points. So the once we encoded them. So we did measurements only on these ones. Uh, these ones are predictions for those that have not been measured. And this is, we kind of compare them uh, neck to neck. Uh, and of course, in this case, our color is a ground truth because we have access to it. And these are the uh, other characteristics that we actually don't optimize for. For example, total polarization and uh, 
uh, normalized curve. This is the same example for polarization. So now we try to find the behaviors where the trajectory is where the polarization is highest. You can see that uh, there is a subset of trajectories where the polarization is in fact highest and the manifold is exceptionally well behaved. So like this. Now let's kind of compare it all together. So we are comparing the BO on the VAE, static DKL and active learning. So basically what happens is that in the latent, if we try to do the BO in the latent space of the VAE, it's not an easy problem, even for a relatively simple scenario like we explore here. And it's not an easy problem simply because our target function can have a, if it is weakly connected to the uh, feature space, then the target function distribution can be very complicated. And Bayesian optimization over such manifold is uh, difficult. When we do the static decal or active decal, you can see that the manifold is much better behaved. Compare these figures with the relatively well-pronounced maxima that we observe for the static and especially for active decal. In fact, uh, that's a kind of not mathematically proven, but we've seen this enough time to say that this is a likely hypothesis. It looks like that for active decal, the parts of the latent space that are occupied by the uh, interesting uh, uh, interesting uh, objects are relatively larger, uh, whereas the parts of the latent space which are not interesting, they are relatively small. So that basically means that uh, these methods pay more attention to what we're interested in and uh, ignore factors that we are not interested in, either uh, pushes them in the uh, latent vectors or completely ignores. So it looks like that uh, DKL uh, definitely produces better behavior, behaved manifolds than VAE. And uh, it looks like that the active learning actually makes a better manifold than the static DKL. So this needs to be kind of clarified more uh, and preferably using the higher dimensional space, but that seems to be the case. So before we go to the collab, uh, are there any questions? Uh, I have one question. So like, you know, um, uh, for the DKL, uh, how does it change the latent structure? I mean, does it automatically update the latent parameters for different target function? Uh, yes. So oh, okay. Uh, the latent, that's actually the trick of the DKL compared to the VAE is that your latent encoding changes uh, throughout the training. So you retrain the network each time you give it a new example. And uh, the thing is that the way the active learning works is that if it is uh, uh, has the optimization component, then it tries to get more examples that have the functionality that you're interested in. If it takes uh, the more examples of the functionality that you're interested in, then the fraction of the latent space that is uh, uh, filled by the positive examples grows because uh, the nature of the VAE, the loss function in the VAE, is such it always balances the real estate in the latent space versus the number of examples. So it's uh, the more examples of some behavior you have, the bigger fraction of the latent space they will occupy. So the nature of the DKL is that it is kind of positively thinking in a sense that it looks for the positive examples. And the second part is that uh, for whatever reason, uh, it favors the manifolds or the, sorry, the distribution corresponding to the optimal functionality to be much more compact. So rather than having useful functionality being spread along some uh, wiggly lines through the Latin space, it actually tries to bring them in the compact uh, regions. If something like this happens, it means that finding them becomes much more useful. We also know what is the price for that. So the price for that, if we uh, build the DKL to optimize certain functionality, uh, it means that all other functionalities would be ignored insofar as they are not correlated with the target functionality. So when we look for rotations or shares, the suit of the card is actually quite clearly ignored. If we look for the suit of the card, uh, 
then uh, rotations of shear get somewhat disentangled because uh, VIE is a VIE, but the degree of the disentanglement is much worse than it would be the case for the proper VIE. So in some sense, you have an algorithm that learns to pay attention to the things that you are interested in. Got it, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's have a look uh, at the... Mm -hmm. I, I just have a question with respect to the with respect to the initial, uh, the ferrosim example where you showed, or uh, or in any example where you have a continuous variable. Um, in that case, I, I'm just wondering in the latent space, what does the maxima and the minima indicate? Uh, is that open to interpretation? Uh, in this case, we have access. So for these examples, we have access to the accessory to the ground truth labels. So we always use. I mean, it's an excellent question because. When you uh, work on the uh, optimization or development of some sort of algorithm, you need to uh, clearly separate what are the things that the algorithm learned by itself versus what are you using in order to uh, kind of certify the performance of the algorithm. Because uh, once you do it for the model examples, you know the ground truth. Once you start apply it to the real world scenarios, you of course don't know the ground truth. So in this case, uh, we show the ground truth labels when we have, because we have that. So next week and the week after, I will show you how it works in the real world scenario when we don't have the ground truth. And importantly, how do we build the approaches that allow us to monitor how fast can the algorithm learn? Okay, thanks. Uh, and also in this, uh, the second part where you combine uh, both the DL as well as the BO, I'm just wondering uh, whether you use the BO for optimizing um, the 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 output function or probably the target, or do you also use it to optimize uh, the 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 latent space? Uh, no. So when we use the BO over the VA latent space, we create the latent vectors from the beginning. We don't touch them anymore; they are static, and uh, then we run the BO over this latent space. So the reason why the uh, DKL works better is because we give it an option to sort of change the representation of the data in such a way as to make the discovery faster. Okay, thank you. Uh, and here I'm also assuming that that the latent space has some kind of a smoothness associated with it. And th that is the reason you're using the BO or so this is a very interesting question, and uh, I am not the right person to uh, answer that because it goes in the areas of mathematics that I know that they exist, but not how to use them. So the question of whether the encodings in the latent space are smooth or not in the mathematically rigorous uh, sense of the word, uh, I don't know. However, what I do know is that for all examples that we have seen so far, the uh, Latin space, uh, when you add the ground truth labels, looks as if it becomes smooth. So it's a big difference from looks like it is smooth to being rigorously differentiable, but practically it looks much smoother, whether it is kind of all the way to the end so you can make the limiting transition and show that you can derive the derivative, or it is just a uh, just an observation, remains to be found and requires a kind of a little bit different background than mine anyway. Uh, another very interesting question here is whether this property would be maintained if you go from the uh, scenarios like cards or process trajectories, which are originally in the high dimensional but differentiable spaces, and then we try to compress it to the low dimensional uh, space and try to preserve differentiability as much as possible. So that's one example. Uh, it is very interesting whether this property is maintained for more complex scenarios like molecular discovery, because molecules are initially sit living in the non-differentiable spaces. If the space becomes smoother or even differentiable for molecules that would be a big thing so but uh kind of again that's interesting direction to explore but uh there is a observation suggests that it is possible 
whether it is fact or not, we don't know. Uh, thank you so much. Sure. So let's uh, look at the uh, let's look at the notebook. So I apologize. Uh, I didn't put it on the uh, call up yet, but oh, sorry, on the GitHub yet, because it is still running. So it's a little bit more uh, time consuming than I thought. But let me show guide you through the uh, notebook and uh, I'll put it on the GitHub when available. So uh, this is the example of the decal for the cards. So again, it's the same approach works for process optimization of molecules. It's kind of all depends what you put as an input. And uh, the same notebook can be adapted to these scenarios because first of all, we use the same approach for automated experiment in microscopy. And secondly, because the network in this case is basically a multi-layer perceptron, which basically means that you can feed in spectrum, you can feed in the uh, selfies or smiles for the molecular structure, so it's up to you. So the way the notebook is structured is the usual installs. So we install the uh, GPAX, Cornea, and Atom AI for comparison. So uh, you already have seen these examples from the uh, VA notebooks. So we install our, we import our cars data set, we generate our uh, transforms of the cards. So this is the same function as we use for the uh, same function that we use for the VAE on cards. We can plot our random images just to make sure that we have a sense of what the data look like. We run our uh, VAE data sets. So just for comparison. So this is the VAE that uh, the normal VAE when we show the ground root labels and ground root shares. This is the rotational VAE. So where uh, this is our labels and shares. So this is the same uh, part as in the, this is the same as in the VAE notebook. So now we go to the deep kernel learning part. So in the deep kernel learning part, there are several parameters that we uh, define for convenience. So we kind of don't have to do it many times. We can do it only once. So in this case, uh, I'm showing the example with the much smaller number of uh, steps than for the examples in the presentation. So I take the initial number of samples is of 20. So I take only 100 experimental steps and uh, I provide some information for the batch sizes. So these are kind of technical. Necess I mean, if you deal with ML, you typically want to have batches. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, the batch size should be uh, smaller than the number of initial seeds because otherwise the algorithm will crash. So uh, that's the only requirement. So notice that the number of initial seeds and the expiration steps is very small compared to the full data set. So a full data set is 2000 examples. We choose to have uh, 20 experiments and 100 exploration step. So basically, we start with 1% of the explorational data as a seed, and we explore only the 5% of the total space. And this is for the system with a relatively strong variability. So one thing that uh, you may be interested to play with is to see how low can you go. For example, what happens if you start with the three examples and 20 exploration steps? Obviously, you, in this case, you, of course, can also exp uh, minimize the number of the uh, points in the full data space, but this is less interesting. So, uh, and uh, one thing that we consistently found over and over again is, uh, whereas if you use uh, GP, you can sample maybe three times less, sometimes 10 times less. So the relative win is at most factor of 10. I mean, it's nothing to uh kind of nothing to be uh, concerned about factor of uh, three or factor of 10 acceleration of the experiment is not a small thing depending on the industry of course but uh for many practical scenarios like if you want to run the active experiment in microscopy factor of three is absolutely not enough because 
the number of sampling points goes down by a factor of three. So theoretically, you can uh, run experiment in a day rather than three days. So it makes a difference. But the complexity of your scanning process becomes more complicated because rather than uh, scan of the grid, you need to kind of go in uh, different parts of your image. And if you do that, the price for that becomes uh, that you have to deal with the non-ideality of the scanning systems and uh, drift. So if I take go from here to here and back to the close to the original location, in the theoretical in the theoretical scenarios, if I want the parameter space of the Hamiltonian, that's not a problem at all. If I deal with the chemical synthesis, that's uh, sort of also not a problem. You can always go back to the uh, original compositions or close to that. If you deal with the chemical engineering, uh, I suspect that it depends because uh, industrial systems or synthesis or whatever has memories of some sort. If you deal with the microscopy, you are not going to get back where you uh, want to be. There will be some difference, which basically means that in this case, you need to add the second uh, step of the drift correction, which means that instead of winning the factor of three, you don't win at all. So point is that uh, Gaussian processes are useful. They guarantee to give you some improvement, but at the price of more complex experimental structure, and in some cases, you can basically bring this improvement to the bank. In some cases, there are some additional complexities that basically uh, reduce your win down to uh, almost zero. For deep kernel learning type of examples, we typically have the improvements of the order of 30 to 100, which is, means that instead of a uh, one-day experiment, the experiment can be run in uh, half an hour. So this is a totally different order of magnitude that matters. For theory, this holds, so we checked. For things like molecular discovery or process optimization, in reality rather than in models, we don't know. So we didn't try it, we didn't uh, check it, and uh, I suspect that given the DKL is a very uh, unusual method, at least for now, I don't think anybody did. But anyway, so this is, uh, this is the introduction, and again, the value of these notebooks is uh, if and only if you play with them, uh, because otherwise it's... Uh, Kind of a little bit uh, waste of time. So this is uh, how you define this uh, exploration of the cards. So this is our uh, data set. This is how we create the uh, target function. So we basically create the copy of all our objects. We make the uh, target array, which is zeros, and uh, we basically create uh, that uh, if the label is zero, then our target becomes one. So this is how we create the label for clubs. So club is uh, label zero. And then uh, this is all there is for the uh, deep kernel learning. So the, again, it is just uh, three lines of the code. One sets your random keys. So this is what Jax wants. Then you set the model which is uh, variational inference deep kernel learning. So in this case, it's variational inference because it's faster. If you use the full uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, it would be much slower. So you define your uh, model. As before, you can uh, uh, have access to the uh, parameters of this function. So you can see that the 900 is the input dimension. So we flattened our array which basically tells you that this is how you can apply for any other data set. So as long as you can encode it as the string of the constant lengths, you are good to go. Then you specify the number of dimensions for the Latin space. So in this case, we uh, use two, again, because it is convenient to visualize. It specifies the kernel that acts in the Latin space. So our observation was that RBF works well we did not spend tremendous amount of time uh, optimizing different kernels versus each other. Uh, and uh, you also have a um, you also have an option to provide the kernel parameters to the Latin space. 
so in this case, uh, we typically use the default values because we don't know much about the Latin space other than it is dynamically adapted to the new data sets. So we generally use some uh, kind of standard values that we believe uh, behave well. Uh, there are also ways how you can uh, define some parameters associated with the uh, uh, way that variation inference works. For example, the guide. This is a fairly complex topic, uh, so that's kind of not going, not looking under the hood. That's more like taking the engine apart and trying to figure out what happens in the cylinder. So we are not going to go there. Uh, I mean, after all, remember that. Uh, GPAX and uh, all this machinery are uh, developed in such a way that they're easy to use and uh, have sufficient application facing capabilities, but not necessarily uh, not ne necessitate getting under the hood to make things better. So then uh, what we do is uh, this is how we train the model is before it gives us the parameters of the length, uh, K scale and noise. So the lengths have two dimensions because uh, our Latin space is two dimensional. So if you, uh, I mentioned that we can use the Gaussian process in the uh, IRD mode, which basically allows us to assign uh, significance to factors of variation based on the kernel parameters. I don't, uh, I mean, it's a useful uh, method uh, that kind of good to know. I was not able to uh, find an examples where it was particularly telling, but maybe it was simply domain related. But basically what you look at, at these parameters, you, you try to look at and find out uh, whether they're close to each other, meaning that your Latin space is almost uniform versus one parameter being much larger and another is much smaller. So I've never uh, seen in the DKL, the mismatch between those parameters, but again, maybe something to look at. The scale and noise are something that you have already seen. So uh, now what we do is we take our full data set and we embed it in the Latin space. So this is equivalent to the uh, this is equivalent to the uh, encoding part of the uh, out encoder. And this is uh, what we get as an output. So this is our Latin space with the uh, actual labels, uh, predicted labels, uh, rotations, and shear. So what you see that in this case, we trained it on a very small amount of data. And the result, the Latin manifold is almost linear. We see a very good separation between the uh, labels. So there are only a few. Uh, labels two, which I misclassified as our, uh, ah, sorry, this is our target uh, values, target labels. So the, all the other labels are jumbled together. Our target labels, which are label zero, uh, they are separated in its own corner of the Latin space. So this works remarkably well. In this case, we don't see any disentanglement in other variables. You can say that rotations are sort of disentangled across the manifold, but uh, not particularly well. So uh, remember that in this example, the VAE reconstruction would look like this. So if we look at the Latin space of the VAE, then you see that, uh, first of all, two, two dimensions is not enough. And second, our factors of variabilities are mixed. So if we do the DKL, we actually solved our problem of identifying clubs compared to everything else exceptionally well. Of course, at the cost of not being able to separate everything else. So we put our attention on the uh, clubness of the image and we got the good answer. So this is uh, the example when we do the same thing uh, in the uh, so we do, what do we do? Okay, one second. So now uh, what we do is the uh, run the same type of analysis as the active learning. So the way we do it in the active learning mode is, uh, again, we specify our seeds. We create the index array because we need to kind of keep track of our objects and pick the one to choose. Uh, we obviously remove the already measured object 
from the uh, from the data set. So once we navigate, we don't come back to this point. Whether this is a right strategy or not uh, depends on the specific problem. So in many cases, if we trust our experiment absolutely, uh, if we do the measurement, we of course should not uh, come back. If we don't trust our experiment absolutely, then it is legitimate to do the measurement at the same location. So the good thing about it, then we measure the reproducibility. Uh, the bad thing about it is that uh, sometimes our algorithm can get stuck in the specific location because over and over again, it feels like it should be measuring the same point. There are uh, intermediate strategies. For example, you can uh, add the, uh, it kind of goes to the point of the engineering of the acquisition functions. For example, you can say that, uh, look, uh, I don't want to get trapped by doing measurement in one location over and over again. And the way I can compensate for it, I can add the term to my acquisition function that will decay with time. So for the, if I do a measurement here, my next measurement in this same location would be associated with a large penalty that will basically disfavor this region from the point of view of acquisition function. However, this penalty is transient, meaning that, uh, let's say, after 10 iterations, uh, this penalty will become zero. And then I can again do measurement in the same location as I, if I have to. So uh, these type of things are relatively easy to add because, uh, as you remember from the BO notebooks, we have our acquisition function explicit, so we can just add this type of term. Uh, whether it is necessary or not depends on uh, your specific experimental needs. And uh, another thing is that when you configure your acquisition functions, you need to take into account of what is the cost of measurement in the same location comparatively to moving to a different location and uh, doing a new measurement. So in some experimental scenarios, we simply cannot do the measurement at the same location. For example, if we do non-indentation uh, or a certain type of scanning probe microscopy, there is no going back. You do measurement only once. In some measurement, uh, it doesn't cost us much to make the repeated uh, measurement at the same location, but it is relatively more expensive to go another uh, port, another location. So in the experimental scenario, it can be uh, in microscopy or non-indentation, that's the cost of moving. Uh, moving over the short distance is controlled by the instrument scanner, so it's relatively cheap. Moving on the large location is something that is controlled by the uh, either larger scale stage, so it's slower, or is done by human, which is obviously expensive operation. So in those cases, we introduce the different price for doing measurement at one location uh, versus the move. Uh, that allows us to be much more creative about how do we measure the reproducibility. For example, we can use the noise, uh, which is not determined through the update of the noise prior, but we can actually define it for each location. So, so anyway, that's kind of the type of things that emerge only in the consideration of the some specific workflows. So I don't want to generalize because the way I will build workflow for non-indenter, for STM, for AFM, and for chemical synthesis would be very different. But uh, all these uh, flexibilities are inside of the uh, GPEX. And uh, if you prefer to use the Botorch, all these flexibilities would be inside the Botorch as well. So it can be done in either environment. So anyway, uh, this is our uh, exploration uh, step. So we. Uh, choose the parameters that we want to save. Uh, we define the number of exploration steps. And then basically we have the very familiar uh, by now uh, loop for the Bayesian optimization. So we initialize our model. Uh, we define the keys. We initialize the model. We fit the model. We compute the acquisition function. So this is our mean and prediction. So mean is a predicted value, var is variability. So you have access to these parameters and you can construct whatever acquisition function that you want. So uh, you also have access to all the points that you have already explored because they're sitting in this uh, explored arrays. Uh, 
which means that you can construct the acquisition function as complex as you want, sort of introduce the penalty for measuring at the same location rather than simply exclude the points where the measurements are already done. Uh, add any kind of uh, penalty associated with the motion. For example, if you run this type of algorithm for the mic microscope data set, you can say that small moves uh, cost a little bit of, uh, has small cost, sorry, small moves have small cost, large moves have large cost, and you can introduce this into the uh, acquisition function. So there is a great flexibility in doing this. And uh, at least in my experience, this is the flexibility that is relevant for the experimentalist. The difficulty, the flexibility that is related to the choice of the uh, parameters of the DKL, the type of variational inference, uh, choice of the uh, choice of the kernel function and so on, they are sitting under the hood. So for two reasons. First of all, as an experimentalist, you probably don't know how to uh, fix them. And secondly, even if you were a theorist or machine learning person, you would not necessarily be able to do that because they become domain specific. So these are not the primary controls that we choose to change. Ultimately, if you want to kind of continue with the car uh, parallel, you need to be able to drive in the right direction and you need to be able to put the gas in the car. You really don't care that much what happens inside as long as it works. So anyway, so this is our objective function. This is our uh, selection of the next point. Is usually it's uh, argmax of the objective function. Then we uh, store uh, our prediction. We choose the next measurement point. We make sure that we keep it index, and uh, then we do the prediction of the full data set. So this is something that indicates the performance, and uh, then we update our training arrays. So we uh, append the new points we remove for those those that they trained on so this is what we use to train the model so this is what it was trained on so now we add the measured point to the array that we train on we remove the measured point from the kind of list of the unmeasured location and uh, then we do the prediction and the cycle is complete so this is how the uh, behavior of the algorithm look like so it gives us the information about the length scale, uh, about the vertical scale, and about the noise. It can be curious to uh, see how it evolves with time. So as you see, we started with the uh, relatively small values from the lengths and uh, uh, noise is uh, 15 thousands. So if you go to the end of the training process, you can see that the length scales are almost the same. Noise is almost the same, so it looks like the things are more or less stable. So we discovered this right manifold fairly early on, and uh, uh, then what we do is basically refine its parameters. Then we save the results. So if we uh, want to experiment with uh, our data, we have the pickle files that contain all of them. Uh, so always a good idea for uh, downstream tuning. Uh, here we save them and we can, obviously here they are saved in the cloud space on the collab. If you want to experiment with them longer, save them, just save them on the Google Drive. Uh, we can load them if we want to and uh, basically uh, repeat the parameters and we can explore our Latin space. So this is now exactly the same example that I've shown you in the presentation, but done with the 10 times smaller number of points. So this is our target vector, uh, predicted target. This is everything else. This is what happens if we take the DKL algorithm that was trained on the uh, 100 examples and apply it to the 2000 examples. You can see that uh, we have the true labels. Uh, we have the true, uh, true uh, wrong targets, and there is a small number of points for which uh, the prediction is uh, uncertain. So it's neither zero, neither one, that's something in between. Uh, 
again, from this distribution, we can get selectivity and the area under the curve. And this is the properties of the ground truth. So this is our ground truth labels. Uh, this is our disentanglement of shear. This is the disentanglement of the rotation. So it worked remarkably well. Then the rest of the, there are uh, three more examples when we do it for spades. So you can see how it worked in this case. So again, they form the, uh, this is a perfect example of the problem that cannot be solved by linear separation because our true object is right in between true falses. So then we do it for same thing by the active learning. So notice that in this case, actually it evolved kind of differently. So our initial seed points, uh, uh, in this case, we were not able to actually form the right uh, compact manifold. We actually, somehow the algorithm created one minimum here and a small number of the points actually formed the separate part of the Latin space. So initially, once we do the active learning, this is a primary group of correct points. This is the secondary one. And these are the wrong classes. And then you can see what are the labels are in this case. So it kind of worked. Uh, but in this case, we clearly needed more seed examples. In fact, one thing that I will illustrate uh, uh, next week is that the choice of the seeds uh, makes a big difference. So you want to choose the seeds in such way as to uh, represent the variability in the system. If you choose much less seeds, then the algorithm becomes prone to the um, being trapped in the false minimum. So then we do the same thing for hearts. Uh, again, you already seen this example. Uh, and we then we do it for the full data set uh, when we say that each label corresponds to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So let me see where is that. So this is still hearts. Uh, so this are uh, all hands as a, a function where we do this uh, algorithm for all four of them. So now they are all separated. Uh, this is how we do it as an active learning problem for all of them. So you can see how it uh, behaved and uh, we kind of got a continuous function that interpolates from uh, zeros to threes, sort of between the different labels. And we see how it connects to the ground truth. And uh, then we have this analysis where we say that, you know what? Now, rather than looking at the hand of the uh, card, I'm interested in the either rotation or uh, shear. And uh, the remaining examples show how uh, this will work for the static and active learning when we try to measure the rotations or shear. So, and actually, interestingly enough, I think that uh, while we were talking, the notebook uh, has just finished. So, uh, yep, actually, it did so. I can uh, share it on the uh, put it on the GitHub. Okay, so now you would be able to uh, now you will be able to actually play with it and see how it works. So uh, on this point, uh, let's uh, call it a, uh, call it the presentation and tutorial. And do you have any questions? I uh, I do have a question. So this is regarding the the implementation of the BO uh, with the decal. Uh, I was. Uh, I'm I'm just wondering in in the first case for the ferrocene you showed that uh, you you basically extrapolate all the points across the entire latent space and then you perform the bo on that. Yep. So uh, do you also do the same thing for the dkl as well? Ah, so that's a very good question. So dkl is not a generative model. So if you have a uh, if you have a space of your possible uh, features. So it can be trajectories that you generated. It can be uh, the uh, whatever examples of the cars. It can be example of the molecules. Uh, 
So the DKL uh, will try to navigate the space as fast as efficiently as possible, but it will not generate the new examples. Comparatively, VAE can generate new examples. So they would be, of course, in distribution pretty much by definition, but VAE is a generative model. DKL is not a generative model. It is possible, uh, so if it is something that you are interested in uh, on uh, collaborating, it, we have the realization of the code where you have the uh, VAE uh, input, then you have a Latin space, and then you have a DKL, uh, the GP on this Latin space that does the optimization, and then you can have a parallel connected decoder that allows you to do the same thing as the VAE, meaning to decode the object. So in this case, uh, you basically have input and then you have a branch. One branch is the uh, TKL branch. Another branch is the decoder branch. The problem with this type of system is that you need to define very well how you are going to train that because the loss function for the TKL and the loss function for the VAE are different. The loss function for the DKL tries to run the optimization problem uh, through the minimiz through uh, optimization and uh, kind of finding out the uncertainties. The loss function for the decoder in VAE tries to uh, tries to uh, reconstruct the object. So these are different tasks. So you remember when I was showing today the examples of how the Latin space for the DKL and VAE look like. Uh, they're not exactly the same, right? So one uh, pays attention to correlations and reconstruction, another pays attention to the target function. So we have the working code that uh, allows you to uh, use the DKL as the generative model. We know that uh, you can put the emphasis on the reconstruction and then the DKL part doesn't work particularly well. Uh, we can put the emphasis on the DKL and then the reconstruction uh, kind of works uh, less well. It is basically a independent project uh, and uh, independent publication, obviously, to learn how to train this type of system first, or system well. I speculate that the correct way of doing it is first put the more weight into the DKL part when we look for the behaviors that we're interested in, and then start to uh, shift the attention from the DKL into the uh, VAE part. But this is a speculation, so we haven't done it yet. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh... But, but I'm just curious when you when you look at the acquisition function in the DKL, uh, how do you I mean how, how do you make sure that the acquisition function uh, does not land on a on uh, on the point where it has not been explored before uh, or the regions which is which is which are empty? Uh, we know that because we by definition calculated uh, for uh, we by definition calculated only by, for the feature that were given from the very beginning. So the uh, setting here is the following. So you start with uh, the full set of your features. You have few targets. So that is our seeds. We train the network uh, having all the features and only few targets. So uh, if we do that, then the network will predict the target for the features which are closest to the ground truth and uh, it will predict something for all other features, but with the larger uncertainties. So once we have the prediction and uncertainty, we turn on the usual Bayesian optimization logic. Logic. So we choose how we want to balance the uncertainty uh, of the prediction and the value of prediction to select the next uh, feature. But uh, throughout this cycle, we have a fixed list of feature vectors and uh, we sequentially add new examples of the target vectors. So when we do that, we uh, change our embeddings for the uh, change our embedding for the features. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I get that. 
But uh, what I'm curious to know is that if you have some kind of a classification task, uh, uh, for example, uh, for finding the labels as opposed to a continuous variable uh, like an uh, like a shear or a rotation, would that be? I mean, you can run it in the same way, right? You can uh, set it in a way that uh, the experiment becomes not the experiment when we run the simulation. So currently, in the example that I've shown, we have the ground truth, right? So the experiment is effectively unmasking the label or unmasking the target. So we don't have to do anything. We just say, hey, I want to actually unmask this one. If we run it in the experiment or synthesis, we actually run the experiment. If we want to use something like this for the labeling of the data, then uh, it will work exactly the same way. We have access to all the data we may want to label, so all the features. Uh, then the algorithm presents one of the those for a human. Human says that this is this label. We retrain the decal. Then it chooses the next label, the next feature vector where it doesn't know the label presented to human, the human says this is this label. So then it kind of continuously updates the predictions for the full feature data set and then asks human for the labels for the data set, for, uh, asks humans for the uh, labels for those samples where the uh, we don't know the we don't know the label and the uncertainty is highest. So in some sense human becomes uh, labeling by human becomes an experiment. And again, okay okay. So uh, we uh, in in the case of DL, do we need a human in the loop uh, as opposed to VO? Uh, so it depends on the setting. So for DKL, we can run it uh, fully automatically if our policies, meaning uh, uh, the balance between exploration and exploitation and the scalarizer function, are set in advance. So until now, uh, all the automated experiments that we run for the last two years, they were done with the fixed policies. Uh, sometimes these experiments work exceptionally well. Sometimes they don't work particularly well. They get stuck in the metastable minimum. Uh, and interestingly enough, the labeling experiment, that's kind of the case where a human provides the labels. So there is actually no human in the loop there because the policies are set in advance. Uh, you the thing that i worked on for the last half a year is how do you bring the human in the loop of the dkl or bayesian optimization so this is something that uh, we are going to look at uh, in detail in a week from now so that is uh, again this is a fundamentally new area in the automated experiment because that's how you make it human in the loop and that's how you make it explainable uh, it requires a little bit of uh, change in the way we think about the experiment because rather than human performing the operation, we have the mach we, it is, uh, machine learning agent that performs the operation and human changes the policies of the machine learning agent dynamically. So one way we can do that is to change the, say, curiosity of the agent. Another way to do it is to uh, change the target. For example, if I uh, my value of my experiment is determined by the scalarizer function, I can say that in the beginning, I want to run the experiment when I want to uh, maximize the area of the history of the slope. But after that, I can say, you know what? I'm not interested anymore. I want to actually maximize the Kersey field. So this provides the uh, way for the human intervention. The reason why it is worth doing is because for many experiments, the time of the human reaction is much slower than the time of the experiment, which basically means that uh, if human runs the experiment, it, human can do it at, let's say, uh, change feedback on the, let's say, few second time scale. If the experiment has intrinsic latency of one uh, uh, of 10 milliseconds, uh, then human is the bottleneck. So then uh, you want human to observe the aggregate output of the hundreds of the experiment and tune the behavior of the machine learning agent on the time scale of kind of hundreds and thousands of the experiment. So, and, uh, mm -hmm. it's very interesting. Uh, again, yeah. it's a new area and uh, the only way to work on these things and uh, 
kind of apply them is actually to uh, is actually to experiment hands on at least on the at least on the simulated data sets because uh, this area exists in the kind of gap which is at this point too theoretical for experiment and too applied for the classical data program. So that's kind of a scenario when we're all collectively going in the totally new area in terms of uh, automated experimentation that could not have been foreseen even two years ago. At least I'm not aware of the single publications uh, where predictions uh, along those lines have been made. So Sergey, maybe I could just ask something quickly. Um, it just uh, just understanding how you're you're choosing to do what you're doing here. Um, if you use DKL, you choose a target, and it works works better for that target. Then you say interested in some other target. You, you use DKL, you choose that other target. It works well for that. So I mean, what if you're greedy and you're interested in more than one target? Does this affect how you choose what you're doing and, and it affects how the seed points you choose and all that sort of stuff? Uh, so these are all great questions and uh, I'll show some of the uh, initial work in that regard uh, next week. Basically, uh, that gives us uh, the kind of description of the workflow of the automated experiment gives us the points of where we can do the intervention. So we can intervent on the seed case, we can intervent on the policy, intervene on the policy level, we can intervene in the scalarizer level, like changing the objective. Notice yeah. that changing the objective is different from the multi-objective optimization because multi-objective is uh, going for several objectives at the same time, so you want to find the Pareto front. Changing the objective is the human intervention. The key part here becomes the monitoring, because for us to provide the human feedback, we need to be able to also monitor the progression of the automated experiment. I know reasonably well how to do it for microscopy, again, because I've been doing it for a while. For material synthesis, that's already more complicated because uh, uh, it becomes uh, very dependent on your target application. So I think I have some ideas of how to do it for the hybrid perovskite discovery because uh, we work for that. For any new problem, it will require to go through the nuts and bolts of the experiment and the observed monitoring signals. So however, if these monitoring signals are available, then then it's doable. Sure. Okay. But uh, again, once we talk about the uh, human and the loop interventions and the applications of the uh, multi-fidelity or generative models, then we are going from something that has been done and published to something that can be done now because we have a code base for that. But then we are firmly going into the kind of collaborative domain because uh, because having the code and few test examples is obviously very different from having the solved scientific problem. For sure. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, I apologize. Uh, so I have to uh, stop here because I have a next meeting. Uh, but as advertised next week, we are going to talk exactly about uh, how you apply uh, this type of algorithms in the real world scenarios. And uh, how do you make it explainable, meaning try to figure out why the algorithm make the decisions. And uh, based on that, uh, the strategies to bring the human in the loop, sort of both why and how. So this being said, see, see you next week. Thanks.